The goal is return on investment analysis. We are laying the foundation to allow the citizens, the leaders of Georgia to look at education, look at true return on investment. We know we will know the elements going in, the cost model will be very clear, and it will set the foundation so you can do that. And then key, the last theme here, is excellence, not basic. The quality basic education codes, QBE, they were fine when basic was the key. Excellence is the key now, and we are striving for excellence. And through the work with the Best Practices Committee, the Strategic Multiples Committee, Community Conversations, uh, we will identify those elements that will give us the opportunity to drive to excellence. The core activities. Obviously, the first thing we need to do is define what is excellence. And we are laying the groundwork for that. All of the committees are laying the groundwork. And in uh, about a month's time, the chairs of the task force will come together with the cost model committee and identify those elements that define excellence in education for Georgia. We will define the best practices to achieve that excellence. And a best practice will be just that, but it will be relative. So a best practice for one county may be a leading practice for another. But we will identify those practices which will drive to excellence the strategic multiples to achieve excellence. A strategic multiple, another way to think of that is an element. What is an element of a special education program that drives to excellence? What is an element of a transportation program that allows excellence to be the overriding factor? Those are the multiples. We will develop elementary, middle, and high school models based on excellence criteria. We will have best practice data, we'll have the multiples, We'll have community conversation input, and we will define the best elementary, a best practice-based elementary, middle school and high school, and then we will seek community input on those. We will develop the cost model to achieve excellence. That's the overriding theme and the core activities. And finally, as I mentioned, we will create a spreadsheet-based cost model. We will not be developing new software. We will use that which is already in the marketplace to keep it simple for all school systems and citizens to understand. The project plan. Phase one, we began November 30th with a meeting of the cost committee in Macon and by January 31st or today with the completion of the project process map which we will go and look at in a few moments. Phase one is complete. The crux of this work is in phase two. The deliverable out of that will be the resource cost and allocation report which will recommend a cost model. And the task force will then make a decision on a cost model based upon all of the qualitative and quantitative research uh, from our work as a uh, separate committees and full task force. Finally, phase three, the development of the spreadsheet-based tool is the heart of phase three. That spreadsheet tool will be delivered to the cost committee and then the full task force for evaluation, review, and acceptance. And along with that, we will create an executive summary on the tool. And it'll be a, it'll be a primer in a sense, if you will. And finally, in phase three, one other uh, we, uh, task in there is we will identify common statewide school accounting standards. So that when, once we have the foundation, we want to make sure we're all speaking the same language in expenditures for schools so we can truly look at ROI. In summary. We're looking at a fundamental shift in educational terminology. We are moving from basic. Basic is not acceptable anymore. Excellence is a standard. Just saying that's not enough. The task force has contracted with IBM to work with them. We will help move the discussion to excellence. Next, the new model must demonstrate Georgia's commitment to investment in educational excellence. And then these three points. It has to be transparent. It must be simple and ensure that all children have access to an excellent education. That's a summary of the project. What I'd like you to do now is if you would turn to the handout that has the uh, blue arrow on it. What this represents is an overview of the project with the associated tasks. What we wanted to do is give you a summary so you can see what we are doing and then we'll go to the process map and you'll have more of a drill down. But as you can see, phase one ending January 23rd, the last item in that column is presentation to this committee, joint meeting of the committees. You see the activities that have occurred beforehand. We've reviewed 
the, uh, the CAFR, we've looked at funding sources, we've looked at the literature review. Uh, some of us have had experience doing models, uh, uh, cost model uh, revisions in other states, so we bring that to the table also, the challenges that lie therein. We begin, we're on the cusp of beginning phase two. Phase two, as you remember me saying, that's where the meat of this project is. We begin by looking at the impact of federal funds on that commitment to excellence. We go through the allocations for Georgia educational programs. And then you'll notice the third point in phase two is conduct a focus group. We will be conducting focus groups of all major uh, education interest associations, such as school business officials, the superintendents association, the school boards association, uh, and so on. We will be then conducting work sessions with the committees to go in quite deeply into the strategic multiples, for instance, into the best practices. Looking at best practices, uh, best pra is it a best practice? Identifying those that are termed best practice, but do they really apply to Georgia? Do they make sense in Georgia? Working with the committee chairs, we will also conduct interviews of the no excuses principles. We'll look at the strategic multiples, as I mentioned. We will develop those model elementary, middle, and high schools, as you see here, and then we will hold focus groups with constituents to gain feedback. There is no money attached to the model at this point. We're looking at the model of delivery. Once we have that feedback, we come back and we finalize the development of the cost model. That is essentially the output of phase two. Now, along the way to completion of phase two, we are going to look at the school-state partnerships, accountability, flexibility, meeting the goals, and making sure the cost formula that we develop includes flexibility and perhaps reestablishes the relationship between schools, school districts, and the state of Georgia. Phase three, then, on the right is August through November, and that is essentially where we develop the tool. We are also going to look at exemplary schools stratified by elementary, middle, and high school, those that are exemplary and those that are considered typical. What are the characteristics that defines an exemplary school versus a typical middle school in the state of Georgia? Identify those because they may be best practices which can help other Georgia schools perform and reach that level of excellence which we are seeking to create a tool that will fund. And then finally, we present the spreadsheet tool. Uh, we will provide those recommendations on financial accounting and then do follow-up. So that's a high-level analysis of the project. And now if you would turn to this very large sheet, 11 by 17, and it is, it is somewhat difficult to read, so <laughs> I, I do apologize. This is essentially the project down, almost to the granular level. If you drill down one level further, which I've chosen not to take you today, um, there is actually the project plan, and we build up. So you can see here on the left in January, project launch. We launched the project. Right now we are down at the bottom point where the process map is being approved. We're at the task force chairs meeting. We had that, and we're at the next to last block on the left side, which is presentation to you. Now you'll notice throughout that on each of the blocks there are these circles that say touch points. This work, the work of creating a new cost model for the state of Georgia is not being done in a vacuum. I am here regularly. I'm also, a, I share residency here with another state. I'm here a great deal and it's important to me that we have a significant amount of input, not only from the committee, but other interest groups. So those touch points are where I will have work with the committee members, task chairs, uh, subcommittees, and we will be meeting throughout and, and uh, different locations throughout Georgia. If you look at this map, this is a blueprint. There may be a few boxes that change here and there as we go forward. It's in a sense a living document. But right now, this supports the program as we move forward. The next meeting of the task force is February 21st, and it's during that week when we have a significant number of focus groups and then we have our work sessions beginning. So the real uh, work of collecting the data, both quantitative and qualitative, begins today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Chairman?
ask you if you would, if any member of the committee has a question, please raise your hand because remember, we are televised and I don't have my seating chart because it's a joint meeting. And give me your number and I'll flip your microphone on. Uh, your number is right under your... Press the button and it'll turn on up here and I'll know where you are if you want to speak. Press your button. I'm learning and that means you want to speak. So I have 20. Would like to ask a question. Oh, that's... Oh, that's nice chairman right there. Oh, okay. Okay. 23. I've got it. She's helping me out. 23. Where are you? All right. Give thank your name, if you would, and address your question to whomever you like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for doing this. I appreciate it very much. I'm uh, Senator John Douglas from 17th District, east and south of Atlanta. Um, what about the uh, 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 education adv advocacy groups? What are, have, they had, have they played a part in putting this together? Senator, we've done, first of all, a couple of things. Uh, as you well know, we've, we've had two community conversations, which we've invited the entire state, including all the advocacy groups, plus we've traveled the state with our task force. But as we go through this process, we will actually rely upon the various associations and groups to provide us the people to give us. One of the things that Dr. Keller talked about is, for instance, when we build our best practice models for like an elementary school, we'll take that model out to the various associations and various groups and say, give us your feedback. So we'll have meetings literally all over the state with a variety of people uh, in making that work. So as far as we know, we have not left anybody out to date. I could ask a follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, this, this whole uh, process and if this thing, this plan is implemented, will not uh, center more authority in Atlanta. Is that correct? Well, that's a very good question. One of the, the tasks that uh, we have added to our work since we started was the task of having a conversation about the partnership between the local systems and the state. And that's going to be a very important element of this. One of the things that, um, that we have learned in this process, Senator, that was a little bit of a surprise, to be very candid with you, is that, that I think there was a perceived partnership between the state and local systems. And I was hoping, as I've traveled the state and talked to people about this, that someone said, oh, no, it's a real clear partnership, and it makes a lot of sense, and this is how it works. Well, the reality of it is I haven't found that yet. Um, we have a partnership that is ill-defined and a partnership that in many ways has caused some of the uh, issues that we deal with with the complexity issues. So I think one of the things that we want to assure of is we bring a new financing mechanism to you all is to bring it with a new partnership defined so that it's real clear on how that works as a partnership. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do in that area, but it's a very underlying principle of not only building this cost model, but how the cost model will work. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, microphone four. Please identify yourself, and I'll be able to do it later and <laughs> just to give you a question. Representative Alicia Morgan from Cobb County, good afternoon. Um, I have a couple of questions, and it Sort of piggybacks to um, the question I was just asked. I was con wondering if uh, GAE paid some of the other teacher organizations um, or even individual teachers um, have been a part of your planning process, um, and will they be a part of the process when you do the focus groups um, specifically, not just are, have they been invited, but are they, will sure. they be asked to participate? Well, first of all, I would share with you that uh, both GAE and PAGE has, has been very faithful to all of our task force meetings, and they've been a a good participant in all our activities. As far as that goes, they were major players and participants in the pulling off the community conversations that we've had across the state. So we, we expect that partnership to continue, um, not only with uh, teachers, but parents, business groups, every group. Uh, you know, the reality of is education is everybody's business in the state. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we just really want to make sure of, I'll, I'll be very candid with you, in our community conversations, we've actually had incredible participation from our uh, education associations and leaderships, the place that we really want to get a little bit more is the business community and some of our local business leaders in our communities across the state to have their participation in this process. So we, we are very appreciative of their work to date with us. And then um, I've got two more, sure. if, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, I heard, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Uh, I heard you mention um, that you were looking at different models and comparing in terms of uh, schools that have done well. And I want if you could um, speak to the diversity of those schools when you talk about model, not just in race, but um, socioeconomic status, um, you know, ge you know, the geographical location in the state. The be between the best practices committee, the strategic multiples committee, uh, we and the other cost model committee, as well as community conversations, we are actually looking now to identify those elements. 
we have not done a stratification yet. And when we come to phase three, when we have the elements, then we'll be able to measure, including those, uh, that, that stratification, socioeconomic, population, metro versus non-metro. So, but we will be doing that. We will make sure that it is a broad base of schools when we look at exemplary and typical. Great. Thank and then you. my last question is, um, I saw in here that in part of your phase two plan is to identify alternative funding options. And I'm curious about whether or not you have some ideas of what alternative funding you may be looking at. Well, when we, I think when we talk about funding options, is, is not some of the issues that you all have been addressing. What we're talking about is as we talk about in that partnership, how that <clears throat> opportunity may exist. And, you know, when, when a partnership occurs, two party brings dollars to the table. But the real question is, is can both parties bring what's needed? And if they can't, how do we deal with it? And how do, is that funding to deal with that issue? So that's one of those things we will examine and look at. We often talk about, is that around wealth issue, whatever the case may be. But we want to make sure we throw a big net in having that conversation that when the local system comes with its partnership portion, um, how do we look at that? And if they're not able to provide that, what do we do? And how is that measured? All right. Thank you. The boards, lights all over the board, so I'm going to ask you if you would, keep your comment, if you would, one or two questions, and then uh, keep them, your questions brief, and I'll take in the order of your call, so don't, I'm, I'm going to keep, try to keep it in order. The next question was from uh, our uh, chairman of the, of the Senate, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, chair, a question, rather, for Chairman Alford, and, and first of all, I'd like to thank all of the hard work that you and the task force has been putting into this effort for uh, several uh, months and I, I guess over a year now uh, from the beginning, but uh, I, I'm especially pleased to see a process map like you've shared with us. And I think this is a type of example those of us in um, elected positions like we are should use as a model in approaching very complex issues like financing education. Uh, it can be done. And I, I, I think this is a great example. Thank you. I, I do have a question, though. Uh, and what I would like for you to do is just share with the group a little bit more about the uh, communities and conversation and some of the effort that went into the development of the inputs from throughout the state, uh, just briefly for the committee, because some of those sessions were held uh, at the beginning when we sure. were uh, in session, and I'm not sure if everybody here has, a, has the latest updates. So just briefly tell sure. us what's been going on there. Senator, our first community conversation was a year ago, January, and uh, we held uh, probably the largest in the history of this state, a collaborative process. If you remember, we were kind of headquarters at GPTV, and we literally had 21, 22 sites across the state, and we had literally over 2,500 people simultaneously participating, but we also had another 8,000 who participated via the Internet. So we had over 10,000 people in this state who had chose to participate in that first community conversation. Uh, and the question is centered around, how do you define excellence? Um, you know, it's, it, that's a very interesting question, and we gained some very important inputs on that. And, and I think one of the things that's very interesting in that conversation that we learned is there's not a crisp, clear definition across the state. A lot of people, it's kind of like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And, but we are challenged to define it because we think that in order for us to measure success, we have to have things that we can measure. And uh, this morning's example, we had uh, Mr. John Grant from the 100 Black Men of Atlanta speak to our organization. And one of the things that, that Mr. Grant underlined for us very, very well in their project success was that if they cannot measure it, then they're not about it. And we will tell you, I think that's a very important thing for us as a task force is about is how do we measure success and excellence and I'm looking at it. We've had a follow-up community conversation where we, uh, we had a smaller group across the state and we gave, them state, we gave them school budgets. And what we wanted to see was how they would react with constraints of where they would put priority. And uh, their top priorities were, first of all, is to provide an excellent teacher and a well-trained teacher in every class. I'll just tell you that now. They, they wanted to make sure that, that was their top priority across this state. And so we will use that format again as a means of engaging the citizens of this state who want to enter in the discussion 
so that as we go about our work, we recognize the, the uh, landscape of which we're entering uh, this whole public policy discussion. Thank you. All right. Uh, next uh, member that would like to speak, please identify yourself. Uh, Mike 24. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm State Representative Jill Chambers with District 81. This past fall, we had a joint uh, committee hearing up in Gainesville for the Gainesville City Schools. It was probably one of the most exciting and, and inspiring education hearings we've had that I've, I've been involved with. And I was wondering if any of the, the Gainesville model examples are going to be incorporated into your final plan. Good question. Um, one of the things that may be worthwhile and, is that the, the task force has made three interim recommendations to the governor, and the governor has put those interim recommendations in his budget request. One of those dealt with remediation of extending it from 9, 12 to 6, 7, and 8th grade. The other one was in 2000 when QBE was tweaked. There were some language problems which basically penalized systems who had raised taxes in that language, and there's $13.8, $13.2 million in the budget to straighten that out. And the fourth, the third one that we recommended the governor was uh, something that we have spoken with both chairs about, was providing $800,000 to allow 13 schools across the state, one in each district, to basically, similar to what you all experienced up in uh, Gainesville, to look at that as a best practice that we want to make sure is a, a part of what we're looking at. So we've made those recommendations, and I'm very excited that the governor accepted those recommendations and put those in his budget. Thank you. Thank you. All right, microphone three, please identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Regina Thomas, District 2, Atlanta, County. I have about five or six, but I'm going to only ask two. I'm going to do a video. Then I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you, Senator. And, and, and I'll, I, I'm not going to even try to, to read this. Um, my eye's not going to let me do that. Um, <laughs> the first question is, and I apologize for being late, will this task force define what is excellence? Yes. Yes, it will. Okay, and um, I heard several groups were involved in this. How about the, the PTA? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right, microphone 18. Mr. Offer, appreciate what you've done. As you're aware, previous administrations have had QBE and, and minimum basic before that. All of which came up with a lot of good ideas, but ultimately only funded a part of them. Is there a commitment for funding to take place when you come up with a plan? And on the same vein, is there a is there some goal now as to what the percentage breakdown will be between state and local in terms of funding? Well, let me try to answer your question a couple of ways. First of all, um, as much as we would love to be able to make the commitment about funding, I believe that lies with you all and not with us. Uh, and, and that's a we'll let you help I understand. I understand. I would say this to you, though, of, of the reason why defining excellence is important and why it goes with this part. I was in the legislature when we passed QBE. But one of the things that we did not do in that legislation, nor has ever been, was what was the desired outcome. And measuring the return on investment relative to outcome dollars spent. That's the reason why Dr. Keller shared with you today is so important. Because I think one of the things that we want to make sure of is, is that when it's real clear of what you're trying to accomplish and what it takes to do that, and those are transparent known issues, then I think the, the political environment is much more mean to doing what needs to be done. When it's cloudy and it's not clear and desired results about what is excellent, it's not as, as uncommon then you get a real division of how people think we're doing and what we're not doing. And, um, but I would say this. I think a, a common ground of measuring what is excellent and success and measuring the return on that for dollar spent is the beginning of laying the, the, literally the public support for what we need to do in education in this state. What, what about oh, we, we have not. That's, that's a good word. We have not gotten to the point of, who's going to pay what, but I would just want to make sure you understand how we think that partnership should be. We think it's a very important dialogue that we will have with the participants of saying, this is what it's cost. Now, coming to the table, who's going to do what, and by the way, what is the desired outcome, and what is the consequences when you don't get what you have? You know, I, I'm a business person, and when I come to the business table with somebody to put a partnership together, and I've got a venture capitalist to say he's going to give me $10 million to start a new company. 
one of the things they always say is, okay, I'll give you $10 million, but this is what's got to happen. No, oh, by the way, if you don't happen, then I'm going to scratch back a little bit more ownership, and it's a real clear deal. The problem we have is this deal is not clear. This partnership is not clear, and it needs to be real clear. All right, please identify yourself. Microphone two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Penny Houston, District 170. On page six of the handout you gave us, one of the uh, outcomes was going to be be simple. Well, QBE formula for the QBE forming, form, formula funding is anything but simple. Amen. <laughs> is, can y'all assure us that y'all will come up with a different simple funding formula <laughs> that that the average Georgian can understand that this is so complicated I don't know who could understand QBE. That's correct. Well let me put this it's a very guiding principle that we sure hope we do. And let me tell you the reason what we want to try to do. We really want to come up with a cost per student. Okay. Recognizing though we have students that that are different. The unique needs of children sometimes require some additional resources. That's the reason what we call strategic multiples. So that we'll know what it costs to educate Johnny, Sally, and Billy, recognizing their uniquenesses may be different. And so we think the simplicity of that is that we know what it costs, this is what it is for those students, and then the question is, is the state and local systems funding to do what it takes? I've traveled Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, and I asked the question, what do y'all think it takes to educate a child in the state? And you know, what do you think we're spending? People don't know that. And so I think it's the real important thing that we've learned in our, in our community conversations and in our meetings across the state is that people do want to understand and, and know that. And when they know where their dollars are going, then again, I think the political will changes and the political support and public support for doing what we need to do will, will come with it. And, and next question, you were here when we passed QBE as yes, a legislator. Did y'all realize it was going to be so complicated to understand when well, you did? Well, let me tell you what I've learned. You know, <laughs> anything you keep for 20 years gets little edges torn and it gets changed and modified. And, and I think the moral of that story is, is this, is that I don't, I think having anything, I, I don't operate my business models, I don't keep them for 20 years. I have to change because conditions change. And I would hope the lesson we've learned here is that when the conditions of our state change and our education environment changes, we cannot wait 20 years and change the way we do business of education. Thank you so much. All right, microphone 14, please identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll pass. Representative Dixon asked the question that I had interest in. Thank you. All right, microphone 26. Um, we talked about, uh, I'm, I'm listening to your travels and you've talked about and I am Freddie Powell Sims, District 151, that's a rural South Georgia, okay? Uh, but you've talked about well-trained educators as well as administrators. What role will the university system play in all of this? Do we have people apart, you know, from the university system or part of your committee also? We have no one from the university system on our task force, but let me share with you as also being a member of the State Board of Education, we also have Chair Boris, who's the chair of the state board, and Superintendent Cox is on our uh, task force, and Deputy Superintendent uh, Stuart Bennett's on our task force. But we have, as you probably aware, of a joint work group between the uh, Department of Adult uh, Education and uh, the Board of Regents and the school board working together. And one of the things that we have done is to make sure some of the issues that we've raised and look at get on that agenda because it really is a simultaneous agenda that we need to be dealing with. Um, the, the reality of it is, is that when you look at all the research, and we've all heard this, and uh, this time a year ago when we had a joint meeting, you all remember we had Dr. Solomon come to us from uh, the Milken Family Foundation, made it real clear that the most important thing we can do is to ensure that we have an excellent teacher in every classroom. And so that theme still rides through. There's some strategic requirements that, uh, that we, we think are important, and that's definitely the top one. Thank you. Uh, microphone 28, please identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ernest Coach Williams, House District 89, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Um, I'm having some problem understanding a couple of things, uh, especially your, um, the part where you was talking about partnership in that if a, a business is partners with this, 
My question would be is um, about diverting public funds for private education. I'm confused there. No, no, Senator, I apologize. I was using an analogy. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. The, the, what I was trying to say to you is that in our state, the state and the local uh, communities provide the funds for education. And, and in many ways, that was supposed to have been a partnership. Okay? And if you ask people, does it supposed to be a partnership, you'll get. But then you ask, well, what does the partnership look like and how is it defined? Well, then there's blank stares. Uh, the point is, what I was saying to you is that any time two people come together and try to form a partnership that, include, that deals with money, you better be real clear on whose role and what you're going to do, otherwise you're going to miss expectations. I had a superintendent in South Georgia tell me, yeah, it's a partnership and both sides are unhappy. Um, and that is a clear indication of when that happens is that the deal's not clear. And that's what we're talking about. It's not in, including business by no means. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say, I don't see any more light, so if you want to speak, please just uh, mash your button there and we'll let you speak. But I want to say to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that I really appreciate what you've done. Having been in education for the past 44 years and gone through minimum foundation, adequate programs, QBE, and now 1187 and this, one thing that educators, I'm hearing all over and I know you are, Let's and I, we appreciate what you're doing, defining excellence, and for once and for all, let's define what it's going to cost. And I, I commend you, and I commend the process you've gone through. You've involved a lot of people, and then let's decide the partners. I like that's something we haven't heard before. You know that I don't think we really understood under QBE. It is a partnership, and what are our roles? And and I like the idea that you're saying uh, what will be our continuing roles, and uh, if this happens, we do this and that and the other. And I, that that's what's been missing. So I I, I think you've You've, you've taken your time, you've met with a lot of people, got a lot of input, and so I just commend you, and uh, I, I like the others on this committee, hope that when we come out, we will be, and I want to say to the legislature, Senate and House, once they throw it in our lap, it is. It's a big partnership at that time, and it's for us to decide, you know, what we're going to do our part, so I commend you. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to, at this time, I don't usually, I'm, I'm going to take Two questions. From, we have about three minutes. Is anyone in the audience? I can't see real well. I feel like I'm in a dark movie house. But uh, uh, if you'll raise your hand, I'll allow a couple of members from the audience to come to the podium and ask a question. Is there anyone that feels a burning desire to ask anything? All right. Is there anyone on the committee that would like to say anything at this time? That Anyone else? Give you an opportunity. All right. We have someone. What's your, mess your, hit your button there. 16. 16. Okay. If you'll give your name and state your... All right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems like my uh, button button's not, not working. working. No, your button's not earlier. punching, right? <laughs> I'm Representative Doug Holt from District 112, also to the southeast of Atlanta. Um, I have a question about the scope of what you're doing, and to some extent it may be piggybacking off of earlier questions. When you're talking about examining best practices, you know, we're talking about a cost model, which gives you a picture of, you know, just a bean counter's view of dollars in schools, but best practices from my exposure to education clearly will have to include two things. First, something to make sure that there is ongoing increased parental involvement, and secondly, something to address ever-growing problems with classroom discipline. Will those two components be part of what you'll be examining and what you've examined already? That, that's a great question. And, and let me say to you, because I think this is a very important distinction, if I may take a second to your question. We're being very, very careful that this is not an education reform committee. Amen. Amen. This is a committee who's looking at education finance, but we want to make sure that as we build that financial model, that it's done under the realm of best practices. Those best practices will be documented. And any, some, many of those best practices deal with how do you deal with parental involvement, how do you deal with those issues. We hope what will happen is then is that in that partnership is that those best practices will be examined and looked at. And, and, and then, hopefully then there are the dollars because they've been designed that way available for systems to adopt. But there is no doubt, let me just say this to you, to, and let me repeat myself, this morning when, when John Grant was speaking to us, the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, one of the things I think John really emphasized for us is that 
it takes sometimes community-based organizations to become involved to ensure to help deal with not only culture issues but societal issues that ensures that we have a learning environment that works. And if I may use an analogy, I think organizations like that, and we have got to find a way to partner with organizations like that across the state to literally bust the ground so that seeds of, of, of educational excellence can plump and really grow. Otherwise, we can throw a lot of seed on concrete and it won't grow. I don't care how much seed you grow, throw. And so it's, it's a real important lesson for us to understand that just throw more seed on concrete will not get the job done. But we have to do some things in our communities and in partnerships with organizations to make our communities in a way, in our area that education matters and that we have generations of children to come that are well-educated in the state. Thank you. One thing I think that we need to remember, too, what Representative Chambers said, a good example in a lot of us is we've visited the state, we've seen these programs, we've referenced it to various members of the staff, and they've checked these practices out. And I think that's it, identifying the best. And I commend you for doing that, and as well as one of the things we looked at in Gainesville, of course, was the uh, parental involvement. It was very impressive. And the discipline, how did it help the discipline? So everything we look at, and if you see some things you think are out there in your system, please let them know they're dying to get out there. And I see members of these staffs that will get out there and look at these and, and document them. And we need to uh, disseminate all these throughout. So thank you. I see no more questions. I know you've got to go and we have a busy schedule. But uh, I do appreciate you coming, the work you're doing. Anyone have anything else? Would you like to say anything, Senator? Just, What's uh, your number? One of the, I am number 21. 21. Yeah, I've got you. Just one other thing, Chairman Alford, I'd, I'd like to again emphasize how much we appreciate the effort and the commitment you and the task force have put into a, a monumental task and the manner in which you've gone out and got the inputs from thousands and thousands of people across the state to consider their uh, needs and uh, desires in this process. So thank you very much to all Mr. Chairman, you. thank you all. And let me just say to you all as both the members of the Senate and the House, by all means, Mr. Chairman, you're exactly correct. If there's places we need to go and things we need to see, we, we welcome that opportunity. Uh, and at the same time, we appreciate the opportunity of working hand in glove with you because the reality of it is um, we, we've worked too hard for this just to be another report. Um, we really hope that we see some significant changes in the way we're doing education, and that can only be done by your acts and your uh, actions here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We want to ask the committee members, if you would, please remain in seats. We want to be sure, every one of you, that you stay for this next part of the program. We'd ask that uh, the first two rows uh, here, if you would, please vacate those. And we'd like to ask our special guests from throughout the state, our students, to come forward and join us. And I, I don't know how to do this, but I'm speaking to the booth, the uh, control booth down the hall. If you would, bring the lights up. We want to be able to see these students. So. If you call, you can do it. Okay. We're going to bring the lights up at this time where we can see these students. So if y'all would bring the students forward. Oh, you got, I'm going to let you You got an agenda. Good. I'll let you I haven't seen it. So. Hey, Albert. I know Albert. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, if he's just good, I would have said, then I'm going to turn, then I'll let him. You know that this guy is going to just make a short... Reginald Beattie, okay. And he's the developer of the performance center centers, and he... Chief Operating Officer, for me. okay, I'll get him, and then we'll turn over the students, right? Yeah, he's going to turn it back to you. Back to, and then we'll... You guys, and then, I'll introduce him, then we'll... I'll let you, you want to introduce him then, and then we'll... And we'll oh, you're good. All right, good. Then we'll, no, it isn't. What is it? What, what's... what's All right, we'll go ahead and get started, and I want to ask all of our guests to please uh, find your seat and join us. You'll enjoy this next part. Uh, uh, remember, once again, that we are being it's broadcast live, and you young people, when you get home tonight, 
Pull up the website. You get to see yourself on there. So uh, be on your best behavior, which you always are. And, uh, so we're, we're just glad to have you. It's been broadcast. And, we, hey, it's new for us, too. We're being broadcast. So we're excited to have you here. Uh, let me say that uh, about two months ago, uh, the House and Senate, we were invited to visit some programs throughout the state. We would borrow this to say we were invited to see some special because we were wanting to look at various programs out there that tried that were trying to meet the needs of the students, uh, where the traditional school was not was not meeting the need was failing students for some reason, and Albert Coleman, uh, uh, one of our uh, great friends down here, one of the education advocates, he stand up, Albert, let everybody see you. Yeah, hey, Albert, we appreciate him. Uh, Albert came to me and said, uh, Reverend Coleman, I have, and he was talking to Senator Moody, said, we have the program we want you to see. So he invited us to visit. Went out to Barra County. Where are my Barra County friends? Hold up your hands. I, y'all remember the ones that are out there. Yeah, to visit and uh, we tried to pick in. I did check. Any Walton County people here? Yeah, okay. We went to look at a couple of programs. But I was so impressed. Uh, this, these are programs that's a public private partnership. It shows that we can do something with the public and private together that was developed to try to meet the needs of students that felt that the public school was failing them for some reason. And we're not talking about maybe necessarily uh, uh, discipline reasons because these are not discipline problems. These are students that say, hey, not meet my needs. I cannot get, I'm, I don't have the the individual help I need or I don't have this or that. And so this program was developed and we're finding students that Probably everyone here would have been dropped out of school, would you not say, if you had not had this help? Would not be here today. But we have students who are going to graduate, going to be uh, great contributors to society, going on to college, most of them, and great careers because someone cared enough to offer an alternative school for them. There are 22 of these programs throughout the state. And I'll tell you personally, I'm a big fan of yours. I'll be a cheerleader. I want to see these all over because I just think it's a great program. But I'm going to ask before we get started, because we're going to be asking you students. You're the ones, the committee. We're going to be questioning these students. I want you, I stood there and for an hour and a half, I grilled these students about why where did it fail you? What did happen? And you would be amazed the questions I had. So I want to get you to ask them questions, and we'll have them, those that want to address it, do it. But I want to ask Reginald Beatty. He's the developer of Performance Learning Center and Chief Operating Officer of Communities and Schools. If you please give, give us an overview. Thank you. Teachers, parents, grandparents, uh, just community leaders that are here with me today. Uh, the Performance Learning Center is for those students, as Chairman Coleman said, those students who were at risk, and all these students will tell you they were at risk of dropping out of school. In some cases, they had already dropped out of school. We graduated well over 600 kids in the last three school years. Uh, this year, we're projecting at least 400 more students that will graduate that are going on to colleges and universities. <coughs> Uh, and again, these students were at risk of dropping out of school. They have to meet the same rigorous requirements as any other student in any school district wherever they are uh, located. And so as uh, Chairman Cole said, we have 22, and we're in the process of moving forward to have one of these, or access to one of these in every county and state. That's enough for me. I want to turn it over to one of our student leaders, and he's going to give a, a broader view in terms of uh, what the Performance Learning Center is, and these students would like to share their stories and entertain any questions that you may have. So again, on behalf of Community Business Schools of Georgia, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I would first like to say thank you all for allowing us to come out and be honest and to give the opportunity to come and speak about this program. I'm going to basically introduce, um, basically scratch the surface of um, what this program is all about. And these students, as you see in front of you, will um, dissect those uh, points that I want to make even deeper. Some questions that I just jotted down, a couple of things I want to make sure I, I mention. Um, some, a couple of questions I think that is important that you all get the answer to is what is a PLC? Um, what makes it different? And is it effective? Um, as you can see, once, once you um, are able to hear from each of these students, you will see that this program very effective in making a difference in the community and the lives of these children. This school is a school of choice. So every student that comes to the school is making that choice to further their education. So their mentality, 
their aspirations on their education is totally different than a student who is sent to school because their parents sent them to school. So they want to get an education. They want to further their education. So they come to the school ready to work, They're ready to get their education. Um, I know something that's important when it comes to numbers, the graduation rate. Every student that graduates from a PLC is a student that probably wouldn't have graduated. So these numbers is going to bring Georgia State numbers of graduation up. So that's another plus that I think is important. Um, each student also gets a high school diploma, which some students, some people um, have a perception that you don't receive a high school diploma. Diploma is like a GED or some, somewhat of that kind of um, diploma, but you do get a credit high school diploma. The purpose, determine the purpose in the children's lives, seeing past just high school, but what are we going to do after high school? Making sure that they have a goal, they have a plan, and they know what their purpose are. Because we can have a million graduates, but if they're not out there um, doing something else about their lives, getting education, going to the work field, and, and they're not um, directed into a certain direction, they might as well be out on the streets, and that is that could cause, cause more problems. Um, Classic City is, I'm sorry, not Classic City, PLC is a, a diverse program. I've experienced it, seen my peers. Each one of these students have a different background um, story to tell you of why they came to the PLC. Mine is somewhat um, simple. Basically, the traditional high schools were not willing to work with me in order for me to graduate. I was never a problem child. Um, I did very well in school. I was very active in my schools. But from moving from place to place, I was not able to reach that goal of graduating on time. So PLC has given me that opportunity to do so. These are students who have became disengaged in classes. I'm sorry. Classic City is my school, so I apologize for keep on saying that. Um, and we are re-engaging these students by location, interest, relationship, and opportunity. Those are four points that I believe are so important in the school, and this is what PLCs are, are offering. Um, the school environment is like family. Um, we're, I've made friends with my teachers. I've never done that before. And I'm good friends with my teachers, so we have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. It is a computer-based program, so each student works at a computer on um, curriculum um, that the teacher basically assists them anytime they need help. So the teacher is able to actually sit down next to the student and go over and make sure that student is comprehending all the material that they need. You do not just brush them through like a um, cattle, horses, or a cow. Um, <laughs> You know, to graduate, but these students are actually learning the material, they're building relationships, which is so important when you go out into the business world and into the community. Um, some of the things that PLC does um, that I think is so important for young people in general, and I get so excited about this program because I love to see young people who are passionate about their education, who are determined to do something with their life. And being a young person myself, I work with a lot of other young people, older and younger, and I do motivational speaking, I travel different places. It just gets me so excited to see a program like this, and students are so happy to come to school. They love their school. They want to go places and tell people about their school. They recruit their friends about their school. They feel education is important. It's a necessity in their life to become successful. And it, it just makes me excited to see that for my peers to say, I can't wait to go to school. You know, I love my teachers. I love this school. That makes me so excited. Um, we focus on our future, as I said before, the career. Um, determine what you want to do in life. What is your career? What is your purpose? Um, we also, many of PLC team up, and we have mentors. Um, I believe our school, um, we are working on having a mentor for every single student there. And that's in Athens, Georgia, which is Clark County, and with UGA students. So we have UGA students who come over who mentor and tutor the students, which is so important to have um, a role model there to help them get through, who can relate to them, who's been there. So I think that's very important. Also, um, the flexibility. PLC allows students to have flexibility in their schedule. One thing I think that PLC has accepted in their program is that students do have lives outside of school. And it's a lot of students who have children, who have children at a young age, who have family issues, who have jobs to be able to function and get on with their life without having to give up one for the other. My personal situation, I'm an owner of a production company in Athens, Georgia, and the flexibility of the schedules allow me to run a business and get my education at the same time. Also to build connections with people in the community um, so I can further 
um, my growth in my business so that I can move on with my career and get an education at, at the same time, which many people think is impossible, especially, especially at a young age. Um, one of the other programs that PLC offers is Future Force, which I had the honor to attend last year at Emory University. It's a week-long camp where they have so many different seminars and different um, professionals come and teach students about different fields. Um, just so many successful people for them to see and inspire themselves after and to be able to see I want to be like that. And I actually got the opportunity to meet two entertainment lawyers is which I want to practice entertainment law. And that was very special to me. I really enjoyed that. And next year I'm looking forward to practicing speaking at um, Future Force. Also, we tackle issues in the community as such as poverty. We have a program called Service Learning. Um, which each student goes out to a service site in the community, a nonprofit organization, and they do community service. And this has turned into jobs, a lot of community connections and things of that nature, tackling issues such as property, um, just everyday living in our community. So I, that's basically all I have to say. I'll let the other students tell you more, but I hope you will take it. Generally, with larger class sizes, um, behavior becomes a problem, and usually uh, an instructor has to take more time disciplining other students rather than teaching what they need to be teaching. Um, when I heard about the PLC, I got there, and it was such a friendly environment, and, I, and the greatest thing about it is that it's small, which allows me to have a close relationship with my facilitators and with my academic coordinator. Um, since PLC is small, we're like a family, and uh, I get to feel like I'm a part of something rather than just a little small sheep in a big old herd in a, a larger high school. Um, in this family, I, I'm recognized for my achievements more, more, I guess I could say better than what I would have received at a high school, and I feel like I've really done something rather than someone just patting me on the back. Um, PLC is just a wonderful program to be a part of, and I really enjoy it. And um, I hope you all take that in consideration. Hi, my name is Rachel Carr. I actually graduated from the Katusa Performance Learning Center in December, last December. 
Um, two years ago before that, I had to change high schools in my 11th grade year, and I came into a traditional high school, and the first few months I was doing okay, I was making excellent grades, but then as time went by, my grades started to tremendously drop. I started failing all my classes. I actually failed every single one of my classes. I was at the point where I was going to drop out. And um, most of that had to do with the fact that I did not feel comfortable at a traditional school. I didn't feel comfortable at a larger setting. There were, or the teachers, you just, you couldn't talk to them. And um, I was going to the guidance, call, the guidance office one day and the counselor told me about the Performance Learning Center. So I was like, okay, maybe I can give this one more try. I went to an interview at the PLC and I got in. And the first year at the Performance Learning Center was absolutely wonderful. As some of the other, other students have mentioned, we are like a huge family. The Performance Learning Center has made me feel comfortable with myself. I am confident. I feel like I can do and achieve anything. And um, I actually have a future now. I have a plan. And I'm very excited about it. I'm fixing to start college. And um, but one of the things I want to stress to you most, the most important thing about the PLC, I think is um, definitely the smaller setting, the program, the computer-based program we have is absolutely wonderful. We have a um, program where, as one of the students mentioned earlier, you go on there, the teachers can sit right beside you, they can go through the problems with you, and if you don't understand something, they will explain it to you. At the, at the PLC, we have um, a, lot of, a lot of teachers that help you with like your um, future plans. We do a lot of that. We have team building. We have mentors for basically every single student. And um, it's just its absolutely wonderful. I know at my school, the Katusa PLC, last year we had 19 students that graduated that probably wouldn't have graduated. This year we are going to have 49 graduates that probably wouldn't have graduated. And I really wish that there were more PLCs because I think that any student that is not comfortable in a traditional high school setting should have the option to go to a performance learning center. So. Chairman Coleman, we're going to let two more students say something, and then we'll turn it over and let the committee ask questions. I, I, just, just speed it up, but I want to be sure everyone I get to meet, because then, then we want to ask some questions. I want to leave time. I really want this committee to ask you some questions. You're hitting on some things that I'm very hot about, so I mean, really passionate about. So we want each one of them to meet everybody. So just come through and say a couple of words, and come on. All right, go ahead. That's the next one. Go ahead. How y'all doing? Uh, I'm Zach Williams. Uh, I go to the PLC in Clark County. Uh, I've been there for about a year and a half. Um, I'll be getting my diploma actually this July. And a couple reasons that I decided to change from a traditional high school, public high school, and go to the PLC are that um, the high school that I was located at in Athens, I felt every day like when I went in, I was treated like a criminal almost. I was constantly watched. I could be searched at any time. Um, there were cameras everywhere. You couldn't, you couldn't go anywhere without being watched. Uh, you were you know, you had drug searches left and right. It was out of control. I really, I felt like I was in juvenile hall or something. It was disgusting. Um, so I kind of got sick of it after about a year and a half, and I started considering my other options. And a friend of mine actually went to the PLC and recommended that I look into it, kind of check it out. I toured it. I liked what I saw. I really liked the small classes. I liked the one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, I like kind of go at your own pace um, with a guide as well. Um, so those are my basic reasons for going, and I really support it. Thank you. Hi, how you all doing? My name is Robert Ector, and I go to the Marietta's Performance Learning Center. And my reason for going to the Performance Learning Center is a little different from everybody else's. In 2004, my oldest sister, 27-year-old, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at that moment, school became the last priority in my life. I didn't care about school. I just cared about being with my sister and my family and, and hopefully living her, her, living her life with her. And I felt as if, if my sister couldn't be a, a graduation with me, then I didn't deserve to be there either. And I, when I was going to a traditional high school, Marietta High School, I tried to tell my counselor this story because I was missing days. But she was, she was listening, but she wasn't listening to me. She didn't, she didn't see what, she didn't see my vision. And 
she was trying to uh, tell me that I should drop out of high school and get a GED. And I was thinking to myself how that's weird that a constable would tell me to drop out of high school for something that's so traditional, you know, that's just not something you expect. So I told her I wasn't dropping out of high school for nothing. And I asked her for any alternative reasons or any alternative programs, and she showed me a thing about a performance learning center. And when I went to the performance learning center, just the whole atmosphere changed my life. And the, the biggest thing in my life was about a mentor. They hook everyone up with mentors, and my mentor is a photographer for uh, the Atlanta Journal. His name is Jim Balt. And basically, he just he changed my life. I've taken pictures with cameras that cost $10,000, with cameras that cost $8,000. And basically, I just want you all to know that you all have the power to change lives, and I hope you all take that into consideration. Thank you. Hello. My name is Loretta Sermons, and I'm representing the Barron Academy PLC. Um, I am a single teenage mother. I dropped out and went back to high school twice. And then I went to get my GED. And when I took my GED test, my GED teacher told me about the PLC. I've been in it for five months now. And I've gotten four credits. I need two more. And I will graduate next month. And I will go on the Valdosta State to be something in the medical field. I haven't, it's undecided. I don't know what yet. <laughs> but... That's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Perry Fulia. I attend Pineville PLC in Valdosta, Georgia. I um, have only actually been attending PLC since early October, and I've now, when I was in high school, I was in danger of failing and not graduating on time. And now after attending PLC, I have caught up my classes and will actually graduate a year early from what I was supposed to. So that is an accomplishment in itself. and. I just really want y'all to know that it might not be a solution for everyone, but everyone should have the option. So, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Denethia Tickner, and I'm from the West End Academy here in Atlanta. And I got, the, I got to West End PLC because during my traditional high school years, I wasn't really focusing like I was supposed to. So when I got to PLC, I really started focusing and now I'm thinking about going to college, being a registered nurse. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Arnold, and I'm from West End Academy, PLC. And, um, and the reason for me to go to PL West End Academy is because I didn't have any other choice because I was trying to graduate, but... I was at my home school in North Atlanta High School. I was hanging out with the wrong crowd and it got me kicked out. And I really didn't have any other choice. So a friend of mine um, told me to come up there with her to West End Academy because it was a good school. And if I want to graduate, you know, I need to be up there. So I came up there and now I'm ready to graduate in May and go to, to the Air Force. So, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Shalisa Moss, and I go to the um, Marietta PLC. And around my 11th grade year, I kind of got behind in all my credits, so I didn't know where to go. So I asked my brother. Well, I was talking to my brother, and he used to go to PLC. And I called Miss I called Miss Roach, and she she um, told me about the PLC and gave me an interview. So I got caught up. Now I have like four more classes to go, and now I go to Chattahoochee Tech, and um, it's called dual enrollment. I go to Chattahoochee Tech, and I uh, go to the PLC, so I get college credits while I'm still in high school. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Sanchez, and I attend Marietta's PLC. And my reason for being there is because I was at the high school, hanging around with the wrong crowds, getting myself in trouble being bored of the class because the teacher was taking care of disciplinary problems. So I was just not attending the class. And the teachers, I just didn't like the teachers for no reason. And over here on the PLC, I, it's more, it's a smaller setting, so the teachers get one-on-one -on -one with, you, they be one-on-one -on, -one on you. So they push you and push you until you, they can't push you no more and you feel like you gotta do it. So they won't be pushing you. And but it's, it's a good relationship we build with the teachers, with the students. So it's, it's small. You don't have time for to be foolish. 
to mess around with other people, and it's just a great problem. It just helped me a lot. How y'all doing? My name is Jared Williams, and I represent the Pineville PLC of Valdosta, Georgia. And the reason I'm at the PLC right now is because at the traditional high school setting, it's distractions like my friends or whatever, and I just got distracted trying to be a part of the crowd or whatever, and my grades fell behind. I would have been the fifth year senior if I would have stayed to the Valdosta High School, and at the Pineville PLC, I finished the year already. I, oh, I am going to be graduating in May, and I'm going to major in communications in college because at the PLC there's a program called Morning Motivation. They give me a chance to talk in front of a audience and I learn how to I learn how to talk to you all like I'm doing right now. <laughs> so thank you. And I just like to say keep it going please. Thank you. Hi this is I, I, it's marvelous stories, marvelous stories and of course we're hearing some common threads throughout these presentations. Large class sizes failed you. You know, we just, there's a bill out there that we're talking about lowering class sizes. And I hear you say small classes do make a difference. The things you're saying. I want to do something I haven't, uh, that before we go out, because I want to give the committee a chance. I'd like, is there a parent out there that could, would like to just say something? Do we have a parent out there? I'm just going to put you on the spot. Would you just raise your hand and walk up to the thing? I, I see a couple of you smiling. One of the parents. Did you just say something about this and what you've said and then My name is Casey Williams, and Jared Williams is my son. Um, as Jared said, it was a it was a change for him as well as myself. Me, his wife, um, his mother, all we went to college and everything. And I thought the typical thing: go to college, your kids supposed to follow like you. But unfortunately, um, I had Jared go back to bed off to live with my mother. And with all that said, he got down here, got with the wrong group, fell behind. And I come to find out that if he stayed at bed off, he would have had to do another year. And most kids these days. If they have to do an extra year, they tend not to because they feel, I don't know. I'm getting emotional because that's my son. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that he finished school. So me and him, we made a decision for him to go to PLC. And that's why he's there to finish on time and to go ahead and finish high school and get a diploma. And in the beginning, I thought it was like a typical alternative school where it was for all the quote-unquote bad kids, but it's not. It's just for some of those kids who, as they say, in the traditional settings, got with their friends, want to be cool, found out that wasn't the right avenue, got behind, and this is a place where they can actually catch up and finish it and hopefully make some, something of themselves as well as for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coleman, I want to ask you a question. The, the schools are funded. The local systems, they decide, am I correct, they decide that they want to. How do they fund these? They use their local budget plus private funds. How are they funded? If any of you want to ask a question, click your mics on. We're getting ready to go, okay? Mr. Chairman, it's a partnership between CIS and the local uh, uh, school district. CIS brings in a total of about 200000 to renovate to the technology and to pay the services coordinator. The school district brings in the, uh, the five teachers, the, uh, the, what we call the, uh, the, the principal, uh, who's in charge of the PLC, and also they pay for the, uh, for the curriculum. So it's a partnership between the, uh, the local school district and also CIS. And your money comes from grants and other donors? Uh, came, the, uh, the first set of funds we got came from the, uh, from the Gates Foundation uh, okay. to start the first, uh, 22 that we personally have, and now we are getting requests from other uh, school districts all around the uh, uh, the state coming to us, and that money is finished now. That's what we're coming to you to uh, see how we can establish it in as many school districts as possible around the state. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, I'm going to give you. Uh, all right, I want to ask the chairman, Moody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, thank each and every one of you for taking the time to share your testimonies with us today because it's, it's real important for all the committee members to hear these. And, and unfortunately, not all the committee members can come to see you folks at one time, and by taking the, the time and the energy to come here, it really helps you get your <coughs> message out much sooner. Uh, I do apologize in that part of the group here right now needs to 
uh, move on to another meeting. Uh, the Senate Education uh, meeting has another meeting. Now, that's only a few of us. And I know the members from the House will remain and continue to ask questions, but I'd like to thank you, each of you again uh, for the efforts that you've made and also the, the personal uh, investments that you've made in improving um, your lives in these programs. I, I know uh, uh, if, if you don't know now, you will uh, later on that the choices that you've made are significant and you'll be very thankful for them uh, for the rest of your lives. And I'd like to thank Chairman Brooks for allowing us to participate in our joint, our very first joint House and Senate Education meeting uh, session today. Thank well, you very much. Yeah. Let me say this to you young people before they leave. You know, in the in government, we have you know you have the House, 180 members, and the Senate, you have what 50. Six members, and you have an education committee in both houses. And when laws are passed, they either originate in the House or the Senate. And we have a lot of education bills we're dealing with, and they'll go to one house and we discuss them in these committees, and that's where they're voted on. They come out of the committees, they go into the full chamber, debate it, and they go to the Senate or the House and they debate them. So uh, we, we appreciate it. And as you heard presenting that earlier, a lot of the money decisions are made by the legislature. Seventy-four percent. Of our new money, what was it, Senator? A million, a billion, what? Eight hundred million dollars new money, and it's seventy, what? Two percent of that's going to education. Uh, the governor is emphasizing education, lower class sizes. We've heard you, uh, governor. As we met, the governor heard what you people said as we went out and visited with people. Uh, they're talking about sixty-five uh, percent of all monies must be spent in the classroom with teachers and not for other things. So a lot of things out there. A uh, master principles. I heard you talk about. Administrators. The governor has a program that he's trying to identify the best leaders in the state that are educational leaders to do just what you're saying. Uh, also, these pilot programs you heard mentioned that we're looking at, try to find best practices to help you. So, uh, Senator, I think uh, we appreciate you being here. And if y'all, y'all, please stick because we're going to ask you questions. Now, the House, we're not leaving. We're going to ask you some questions. David Cassis, our chairman, has to. Do you have a question you want to ask before you leave? No question. Okay, thank you. Have a teacher right here from Mary, from Cobb County, uh, young people. That's uh, he's a social studies teacher, right? I want to uh, let you just hear from the committee. I would like them to, uh, if they have some questions. Now, I have, I'm going to get you in order. Number first one I have is number four. If you'll give, introduce yourself and tell the young people who you are. That's me. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alicia Thomas Morgan, and you probably heard me ask questions before. Um, I represent Cobb County, and used to have a little bit of Marietta in my first district. Um, but I, I wanted to, I don't have any questions for you. I want to make a couple of comments. First, I want you to know, because um, I'm sure when you look at me and some of the other folks that I serve with, you probably thought I was one of the interns, or right? You probably didn't realize that I was actually one of the members. Um, and I, that's exactly my point. I want to uh, let you know that I'm the youngest serving member of the General Assembly and got here when I was 23. And so as you think about your careers and what you want to do once you graduate from college, you ought to think about serving in the legislature. Not from District 39, because I'd like to be here a few more terms. Um, but we could use your experiences um, in, in terms of how we make laws in this state. And I hope that um, you will continue to stay involved. You, some of you, is probably the first time you've been to the Capitol or participate in this kind of committee meeting. And it is so important that you get your stories told to as many legislators as possible. And then you get here as legislators because that's how good policy is made when people like you who have those kinds of experiences can come to the table um, and make sure that good, good policy is passed. The last thing I want to say is you make me proud. You make me proud as a female, as an African-American, as a young person, as someone who has my own experiences and how I got where I am. So please keep up the good work. Um, and when you feel discouraged or you, you, know, you have those days because we all have them, think about this moment. Think about when you got up there and you told your stories to us and the pride on our faces. And I hope you can feel the pride in the room of all of the things that you've done and said um, and all the challenges that you've overcome and where you are today. So just remind yourselves of that, and thank you, and keep up the good work, and thank you to all of the good people who work with these young people. Thank you for your commitment and your sacrifice and for your, um, your innovative ideas to, to realize that sometimes we need non-traditional ways to educate young people. Thank you. Before I call on the next person, I'd like to ask one question. Any of you can answer it. You can raise your hand to answer this. What, is the, what do you think... 
the, the key things that caused the traditional school to really bother you? I heard you say several things. But what would you say are the number one, two, or three things? And not just necessarily the school. You, your parents, you know, let's, it's a total thing. I see your hand. Stand up right there and talk to us. All right, I'm going to ask number 28. Ask, turn your mic on and introduce yourself to the young people. Is it on now? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, young people. But I will not, uh, I would echo the same thing my colleagues have said earlier. I'm a 30 plus year teacher and I'm still on the front line, and that's something I do when I'm not in session. However, my question is to you and your PFC is that uh, are you all allowed to go, in, if you're interested in athletics? Are you allowed to go back to your uh, traditional school or your homeschooling to participate? And are you on the same guidelines as that school uh, uh, guidelines and you're participating in those programs? If anyone wants to address that, you'll step to the mic. Yeah, get little young man, he let you speak. Yeah. Go get, yeah. Well, at the PLC, it depends on how many credits you have. If you are able to. Like, if you're in the right grade, you can play sports. But if you're a credit or two behind, if like you're supposed, to be a, you're supposed to be a senior and you're a junior, you're not able to. But if you're a senior and you're supposed to be a senior, you can play. Same as in public schools where you have, you have to be on grade. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, Angelo Nebbi Napolitano, principal at the Catoosa Performance Learning Good. Center. 37-year veteran of, uh, of education, and in my 37 years, I've never seen anything like this that has such quick effect. It's the way we deliver instruction and the and appealing to the needs of the kids. To answer specifically your question, we follow all the guidelines of, of the state as far as uh, uh, athletic participation, ROTC, band, and in fact, our students graduate with diplomas from their high school. They don't graduate with a diploma from the PLC. They graduate That's with a diploma from their high school. So we're just, in that sense, an extension of their school. Uh, another, since I'm up here and I'm principal and like to talk, uh, I will ask, say one other thing. The teacher preparation in this program is critical. Uh, teacher, you still have to have that excellent teacher in there, and the training given by this uh, staff, the CIS staff, does a wonderful job in in helping uh, teachers deliver instruction in that in, in those uh, along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Henry Kirkland, and uh, PLC is just really flexible. It's uh, they're able to work with me. Um, I'm the I'm the secretary of our of the Statesboro High School FFA chapter, and if um, if there's a an emergency meeting or something of that sort or if there's a meeting that requires me to um, leave PLC and go back to Statesboro High School then they're able to work with me on that and I just really appreciate the flexibility of the program. So you still feel part of the whole program then which yes, is great. Sir. great. All right question number microphone number two. Thank you I'm from Berrien County Penny Houston District 170 and I was real fortunate to have a performance learning center in my district and uh, it just begun this September, I think. Correct me if I'm not correct, but we formed a charter school and with the blessings of our school board and our whole community is real involved in our performance learning center. I don't, could you explain to me the advantages of, of having a charter school in this? Why did we do this, the charter school when I hear? We currently have uh, three uh, charter schools, uh, three public charter schools, obviously, from the school district. Uh, the advantage, one main advantage is obviously the financial gain that the districts are able to get some additional funding to support the charter school. But once they're all in the performance, they also have their own school code, whereas, as the principal said, uh, at the high school, 
at the PLC, it's an extension of the high school. They get their diploma. In the case of the charter school, they actually get their high school diploma for whatever charter school they attend. But once they're inside uh, the building, all of the schools operate the same. Well, one of the advantages, too, I would think, uh, our young, I remember when we had a luncheon in Nashville a couple of months ago, some young girl came up and had to drop out of public school because of the attendance, yet in the, the PLC she could complete her education because of the attendance uh, requirements. And one other quick question. I know in uh, the uh, Bering Academy Performance Learning Center, you have community service. I know they put on plays for kindergarten students. Do all PLCs have to do part of community service? Yes, ma'am. This is Lawana Williams. She's taken over as the executive director of the Performance Learning Center. I'll just let her answer that question. Okay. I want to mention two things. You mentioned about um, the attendance. Yeah. All of our performance learning centers have a seat time waiver from the State Department of Education, which allows us to be a little bit more flexible with our instruction. Now, what that means for our students is you just heard one student say that he has the flexibility of being able to go back to the school to attend meetings. Some of our two, uh, students um, are in sports, chorus, band. So it allows them that flexibility to go back. What the seat time waiver means for us is that students don't have to spend 180 days sitting in a seat gaining instruction in order to get credit for that particular class. Because our program is individualized and self-paced to meet the students' needs, they finish as rapidly as they possibly can. In the same respect, if students need a little more time and a little more guidance, the seat time waiver allows us to do that as well. And that's just one of the other flexible points. Um, you mentioned about the community service. What we have is service learning. Service learning is actually community service with a ramp up. Um, it's community service that ties back to the classroom. So that there is learning taking place and there is a tangible product that comes out of it. For those students in Berrien County, it's going back and working with those elementary school students. For all of our programs, service learning is a component. Each student has to complete one service learning project per year. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but service learning is more than just a one-time shot deal of going out, collecting cans, or giving food to the needy. It's actually tying it back to education and finding the relevance in the community for even doing the project in the first place. All right, thank you. All right, 20, Mike 26. Um, <coughs> lady just mentioned seat time waivers and we they've been around for many many years and in fact we've asked over the years for those uh, individuals I guess in schools that did not have the public private partnerships for those waivers to do just what's happening with these because what the students are talking about are classic examples of things that are happening statewide all over the state so my question is if we only have 22 of these performance learning centers throughout the state. Do we have other programs of the same models or the same format in other schools without that intervention from uh, the private sector? Yes, good question. Good question. I'm going to ask, uh, uh, our, we have a superintendent, former superintendent on the uh, uh, committee here. I, I want you to know that there's a former teacher. Raise your hand. Let, let them see the teachers. We have former teachers here. I was a teacher. Principal, I was assistant superintendent. Crick, we have teachers here, so we we're all uh, teacher. Her husband, either they either husbands, wives, or there's a lot of connection with education. And be sure we're gonna go home and tell them about it. So she, she'll let her husband know. But uh, he was talking earlier when you were speaking. He said they had been doing something similar to this to answer your question for years. So talk about it. What number are you? What's your mic? Mess your button there where I can find you and get you turned on. All right, now you turned on. Dalton City Schools and Whitfield County Schools uh, some 18 years ago decided to try a similar type of approach, uh, an alternative school that was a voluntary thing. Uh, they used the seat time waivers. Uh, uh, students in, our, in that program had the option of a diploma from their home school or, or from the Phoenix, what we call the Phoenix High School. Uh, it's, it's been a very successful program, We're graduating probably 60, 70, 80 kids a year now. I, I can tell you as a superintendent of all the graduation ceremonies I had to go to or, or that I had the privilege of going to, let me state that. Uh, the Phoenix High School graduation was the one that was really the most moving the, the, as, because we heard testimonies from students very similar to what we've heard today. Uh, so yes, there are a, a, a number of systems around the state that have 
programs that have maybe not every component that they're talking about here, but that have most of those components and, uh, and that are very successful? Um, one thing that has really impressed me when I, when I talk with you students before, and I want the committee to hear this, the thing that keeps just over and over and over, we've known, we know as educators that one-on-one -on -one does make a difference. One-on-one -on -one makes a difference. Having time, smaller class sizes, people who care. Uh, would any of you students be willing to comment or like to comment? I, when I was in uh, Barrett County talking, one student said her problem started in the middle school. It's a really tough time. Did, did any of you find that? Wh where did your problems? Was it just high school? Did they start earlier? Yes, sir. And why did it start those earlier ages? Actually, for um, Classic City and Clark County School, I go to one of the things that our student council is working on is establishing a program where the students at, class, at the POC can go into the middle schools and mentor them. I feel personally that the problem does start in middle school. For me, when I, I was an exceptional student always throughout school, especially elementary school. When I got to middle school, I basically hated it. If I could drop out, I would have because it was just absolutely terrible. Because I feel like that's the point in life where young people are trying to find themselves, trying to figure out, you know, who are they as a person and going through that transition becoming a child to a young adult. So I felt that whatever, um, whatever that the students here at the PLCs could do to persuade the students to stick to education, to be there to mentor them, and to prepare them for upcoming things that they've already been through, I think that would prevent a lot of dropouts also. But I do believe that it starts in the middle school. Thank you. I want to ask you, put you on the spot now, students. You're up here. You're, you're, you're a legislator. You're making these decisions. If you, for education now, and parents, you parents out there, it doesn't have to be uh, you uh, students, but if you could make, you could pass a law I'm for education that you think would help students to not have to go through what you have to go through or to experience what, 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 is, what is one of the things you want us to remember? What would you, what law would you, or, uh, would you like to enact? Anybody want to raise a hand and try this? Anybody? All right, what would you do? Stand up, come up that mic and tell us what you do. Others think about it. I'm going to let two or three of you come up there. Say that again. I want to hear that one again because you're with me. Say that. That's important. Law, listen to what she's saying. That's a good point. Okay. The law says that you have to pass all five parts of the GGT in order to graduate. I think we should be able to pass, to pass at least four parts of the GGT in order to graduate. Okay. Now, do you students have to do that too? Do you have to pass the graduate, Georgia graduation test? That's, is that a problem? Okay, a good point. What would you do if you could pass? That was a law you'd pass. You'd, you'd have that graduation test revamped, okay? And let me tell you, let me remind you, let me say to you, that was a big issue here last year. And we've heard that a lot. Yes, yes, sir. What would you do? I don't kind of what she said. Um, I'm in the position now where I've passed all my graduation tests and all my AC exams and everything. And I'm actually retaking classes that I've already that I've already exceeded almost, in a sense, because I've already passed my 12th grade literature class, as far as that goes. But the, the, the law says that you have to have 11th grade, 12th grade, 10th grade, you know, all this. I've already passed the 12th grade. And I've already passed all the exit exams. Well, I don't feel, I don't feel like, because I've taken it five times. I mean, I slacked a lot in that class. <laughs> I can teach the class, you know. I just don't feel... I don't feel like I should have to have to go to high school to earn a number rather than an education. As far as I know what I need to know as far as education goes, because, I mean, I can do all the work, and it's not a problem. It's never been a problem. It was act, the actual doing the work. But what I don't feel, I don't feel like that you should have to have to meet a number rather than an like an education. Because I'm on the educational level, it's just... I'm earning a number of credits. Like I'm taking classes that, that, I mean, uh, that are important, but not as important as like core classes. So I just don't, I don't really feel the, the, the need for classes that I don't need. I guess. Okay. Anyone else? If you could pass a law, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> this may be your one chance. <laughs> I'm the uh, AC uh, academic coordinator for uh, Classic City High School in Athens, Georgia. And one of the things that about the graduation test that our students do, they're not afraid of a challenge, that's for sure. 
But our students um, are immersed in math and language arts from kindergarten through high school. The two that they have the most difficult with, difficulty with are the science and the social studies because it's so specific. And it really affects older students in a negative way because a lot of these courses they take as ninth graders, tenth graders, and yet we have students enrolled in our school who have come back to school maybe 20 years old now who want to still get a high school diploma, but they almost have to go back and relearn the courses that they've taken. And so in my opinion, it's much, uh, much more fair is the end of course test that goes along with the, with the say, biology, for instance. I think that is uh, something if, if I could change the law, uh, again, I'm not afraid of a challenge, and our students aren't either. But uh, it's in, in some ways it's very unfair, especially to uh, the non-traditional students. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask you another question. You, a lot, several of you mentioned about discipline. I want to ask you now, I want you to be very honest with us. Most of our high schools are very large when we start, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, whatever. What, what, do you th what do you think is the reason that today that a teacher has so much, you know, you, you said there were discipline problems. What do you think is causing the discipline problems? What do we need to do? If you were a teacher, what needs to be done where they can control the classes? Because we're, having some, we're hearing some things about discipline. Yes, sir. One teacher should have to watch thirty something kids at one time and expect expect them to control all of them at one time. I think like our PLC, you can get more in, in depth with the student if you if it's ten students to a teacher, you know what I'm saying? So they can work it out. Well, let me ask you this question. Well, yeah, I'm put you on the spot. Why, why do students, why are the students misbehaving in the class? You know what I mean? What, is, is, is it, why do you think students are, are misbehaving? And I mean, be brutal with them. Tell me what yeah. you really think. Yeah. With a lot of students together, you have a chance to. Some kids know each other, and they try to. Let me see how to put this. They try to lollygag around and try to play around just to get admiration of peers or whatever. And if you shorten up the room, if you make, like, say, I put ten kids. If you have ten kids, it's less likely for all of them to, to be misbehaving. It's more likely for. For thirty kids to misbehave. Why are they doing that? The why are children discipline problems? What's what's making them do it? Why are they the discipline problems? Peers, it's too much peers around each other. Peers. You have to give them structure. Okay. Without structure, you can't really get anything done. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna take a couple more questions. We're gonna bring to come on. Yes, I just need to make a comment about that. Uh, yeah. student, uh, discipline is an issue in all schools. Certainly, uh, and my experience over the many years is that students, if you have a choice of being thought of as bad or being thought of as dumb, usually they choose the bad. And the dumb part is because the, 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 the uh, instruction in the, uh, that, that they're getting in the subject matter is not relevant to them. PLC makes it relevant to the students and it become more, there's more ownership in what they're doing. So therefore, now we have some knuckleheads. I'm not saying we don't. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, we, we, the kids, it's real to them and therefore the discipline issues are not, I don't have a, I don't have a dis, I'm the person there at the school is my, okay. my point. There is no, right. they don't have a special ISS room. All right. I let these next two people. All right. Sure, Cole, let me say we've only had two fights in the history of the Performance Learning Center, and I think one of the main reasons, besides the class size mm -hmm. and the structure, we focus so much on relationships and training as it relates to relationships and how you react and how you work with this particular population of kids. So it's not just math, English, science, social studies, and curriculum focus. We focus so much on relational uh, aspects of the school as well, and I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't had the type of discipline challenge that maybe some of the other schools have. All right. I have another question here in just a second. Let's take these two, then I'm going to come with your question down here. Yes, ma'am. He took the words right out of my mouth. It's all, the, it's all about relationship. I mean, when you have a classroom full of 30 students, it's just very different. And then you might have another class and another class and another class. You're adding up to 120 students. Our teachers have a relationship with our students. You build up collateral. So that if you are having a bad day with that student, you, you have a relationship that you can negotiate and work and budge and, and, and inch your way to where they need to be. We have zero problems with discipline, and we have students coming into our school with maybe 70, 80 write-ups. That's significant, and it is. It's all about relationships. I also wanted to mention that um, certainly in Athens, I'm, for, I'm the services coordinator at, in Athens, um, we have a major poverty issue. And one of the things that I feel is just kind of um, a showcase is our school. 
because we're embracing poverty, not only getting these kids diplomas and having them have a future, but also our kids in our school are working out in the community in their service learning projects, um, dialoguing with honor students at UGA. We just had a consortium where they identify five problems in um, Athens, poverty, homelessness, transportation, um, the air quality, and also the eye cameras downtown. They worked with our students to develop issues and um, a, a, a recommendation to the council people. And that way, they are able to share with our students and the honor students an issue that is going to be pre presented to the mayor and possibly change the, the stream. They're becoming ambassadors. Very good. Our right, young lady, and then we'll go to our representative over here. And then we're going to bring it to a close because I want us to, I want us to be able to get down and interact with y'all a little bit. Yet, um, the problem with discipline in school, in my opinion, is that the teachers don't know the students. There's thirty some odd students in a classroom, and you just look at them like you have to control the classroom, you have to teach the subject and the material. But maybe a student doesn't get the attention at home they desire, so they want to speak out in class, or maybe they have something valid to say. And so sometimes teachers don't look at the individual and be like, okay, well, maybe we need to talk to them, maybe we need to touch on that subject or something like that. They're just like, okay, be quiet, we have to do this, let's go move on, you know. So I think the problem is that teachers need to be more involved with the students as a person and not the student in a class. Well, 30 students in a class, 50 minutes. If you give one student, each student, two minutes, you don't have enough time. You're right. You don't have anything. You're, that's a good, good point. Appreciate that. Representative, let me get this down and come to you. Representative? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Bobby Reese. I'm uh, representing Gwinnett County, Buford, Sugar Hill. Uh, I want to comment, one, on the group in general. Um, I've been sitting here watching you, and uh, you all are focused and, and very well behaved. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, you mentioned about bullying a while ago, uh, um, but I don't see that projecting out of any of y'all, uh, which is, is a good as a compliment to you. Uh, uh, we are a civilization where, you know, you don't want to be put in a mold or made to act a certain way, but there are certain, there's right way and wrong way to do things. Y'all's uh, presentations and, and just yourself today uh, projects a very positive thing, and, and that's good. Um, I want to come, and I know y'all probably thought I was a page too, right? I look so young. <laughs> uh, I don't have that problem anymore. Because uh, I'm getting my grandkids through school now, so I'll make you old quick. Um, I did want to ask somebody, how do, how do y'all hire your teachers? I mean, it sounds like to me y'all got the, all the good teachers, and maybe that's why you have so much success. I don't know. Uh, I'll just quickly say I had the uh, benefit of being able to select the teachers from the district. And I okay. so I was able to select teachers that wanted and bought into this idea of helping uh, helping young people. And I mean, when you're talking about uh, five pick teachers out of a pool of you know, a thousand, you can get some of their best. That's what I might add that teachers need to be experts in their area. Experts. Right. Every teacher of the six teachers I have a thing are so much smarter than me in their area. They're not better principals. <laughs> and, or legislators, right? And they, have, and they have to be, but they have to be generalists in their approach. Experts in their area, but generalists in their delivery so they know something about everything. Real small question, real, real quick. How about as far as pay for the teachers, I, I'm sorry I came in late and y'all might have went over the funding no. and everything. But the school system picks it up. Their, their teachers have all the uh, money and benefits the regular teachers okay. do. Okay. Good. Community right. Schools of Georgia staff, Moana Williams and her staff, actually prior to the memorandum agreement starting the Performance Learning Center, we go into a school district with the superintendent, get the approval from the board, and we actually coach, provide the uh, process for hiring the staff uh, we sat on the committee to hire the principal as well as the teachers and so communities and schools of Georgia. Besides training all the staff, all the staff development, we're also a part of the selection process of the staff and the teachers as well as training the staff and counsel that traditional schools on the selection process of the students as well. All right, we have a question here and then we're going to, then I'm going to, I'm sorry, from the leg. All right, Mike 22, introduce yourself. I'm Willie Tarleton from District 145 and that's one of Robbins, Georgia. I have sat here and, you know, listened, and it's, it's been very impressive. But my question to the students and the teachers, um, I know you're selling your program, which is good. What positive thing do you have to say about the public school system? They are now. These are. This is a public school. I want to say this now. Know, this is yeah, 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 the traditional, traditional, traditional. That's a good question, though. Traditional. Yeah. What 
What do you have positive to say about that? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Daniel Edenfield, and I'm the academic coordinator at Bullock County Schools. And uh, I was a facilitator for two years, and then I came on board as the academic coordinator this year. And uh, the thing that oppresses me most and is really positive is that the public schools, it's a win-win situation, the PLC and our public school, our Bullock County school system, because uh, AYP, we're trying to help out to get kids graduated. I work with counselors every day and principals. I get calls. Uh, our, we're full. Our system's full. We have uh, 75 slots, and I've got 80 kids through some flexible schedule and probably about 15 on a waiting list. We presented to our board last week. We're trying to get another facilitator. Um, we're busting, and we've got a long list of kids that want to get in. Uh, positive things is that in our system, they see a need for um, something different, that every kid doesn't fit in the traditional classroom. A lot of our kids, they just don't like, they're overwhelmed. Uh, kids that presented to our board, they, were, um, they brought up the same kind of things about the family atmosphere. But... Um, in my mind, it's just that everyone wants something good for the students, and uh, the PLC seems to be a good way for them to do it. You know, thank you, Mr. Representative, for that question, though. That was a great question. That was probably one of the most important questions we've had today, the fact that what how, you know, the, the, the fact that this is a public school, but the alternative, different ways. Every child does not meet, fill in the same mold, and we've got to let them do that. Let me take this other question. I'm going to get you two. You two are next. All right, Mike, 18. Tom Dixon, District 6. I was just going to respond to Representative Reese. I, I know in the case of our alternative school, or the Phoenix school, we also have a lot of retired teachers where we, we can go out and pick the best of the lot, and they're coming in and teaching one or two classes and, and just really uh, doing an outstanding job with that. So th th there's quite a pool of, of excellent talent out there that fits well into this mold. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I had a question here. The gentleman back there. Yes, sir. Just take. You know, one thing you said, one thing we, we have in a mindset that we, the community has, we thought of so long of alternative school, discipline problems, kicked out, can't do. But we're talking about alternative learning environments, different ways, and that's important when we talk about this. You have done that, and we're going to find another term because alternative can mean many things, not just discipline, and you have, you've given us that today. Yes, sir, you had a question, then we're going to take these two, then we're going to have to bring it because we want to get down there. We, a lot of these people got to get to other meetings. Yes, sir. That's it, and we've been so afraid to get out of the box and think out of the box. Let, yes, ma'am. Yes. And PLC is for a lot of students, but not everyone. And now, with the PLC, you have two alternatives to 
You know, you you good point there. You know, we had these uh, uh, the magnet schools. We said for this, that, for so long, and all we're saying is this is a type of a magnet school or another alternative learning style, and that's what we've got to keep in mind. Uh, it's not an alternative discipline school, but this is a different type of learning strategy that I commend you. And that's what I want. Again, best practices that we're looking for all over the state. And yes. For you and for your parents too, because because one of my children, she just didn't fit in, and she struggled through high school and, and didn't go to college. And, you know, love her to death. My oldest one's got a doctorate in pharmacy. And, you know, but my youngest one just didn't fit in. And, and I wish we'd have had something uh, different for her. You know, because she's very proud. Right, last comment. Last comment. Yes. Um, this really is. <laughs> Very good. That is, and that's a good, very important point. I want to remind you, young people, that you can go home tonight. Well, in 48 hours, you can pull this up. Uh, you can see this on. Uh, I'll let you tell us that. They can see this. Uh, the, and I can't. I'm, I'm trying to read it, but you can see it on the website, the uh, Georgia website. So tell them, tell them about it. Yeah, if you go to www.legis.ga.us, is that it now? Yeah. And you'll see, click on the House website. Each committee has a page. And, of course, this is the Education Committee. If you click on the Education Committee page and then click on Archives, you'll see a little, um, I think it's like a little video camera. Click on that and it will open up the browser and allow you to watch all of the entire meeting. So in a couple of days, go back to your school and let the class look it up and see yourself on TV, on the computer. We want to thank you all. We want to give you an applaud and just to give you a round of applause to thank you all for coming. Now, we're going to come out there and meet with y'all, so we just, uh... Yeah. Hey, oh, sure. yeah, no, that's good. What? Well, well...